grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Regina. Today is April the 14th, and we are continuing to celebrate the resurrection of Christ on the third Sunday in the season of Easter. Greetings to all of you who are worshiping today here in the church building and also online. If you're here, you are certainly welcome to come downstairs after worship to our gymnasium and enjoy some refreshments and fellowship. Our youth group is meeting today in the Kennedy Room around 12 o'clock. Next Sunday, uh, during worship, our theme will be healing and reconciliation with Indigenous people. The Mission and Outreach Committee has inv invited the Executive Director of the Saskatoon Native Circle Ministry, Della Nippy, to be our guest minister. Don't miss this opportunity to hear about the work of this important ministry of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Also, plan to stay after worship next Sunday because it's birthday Sunday and you're going to be treated to some birthday cake. There is a sign-up sheet in the Northex if you are able to supply a cake for this event or just come and enjoy some cake anyway. We're excited to share that some of our youth from our congregation are going to be attending the National Presbyterian Youth Conference in Ottawa this summer. It's called Uplift. We've been saving some money up for this event, but we always need a little more. So you can buy tickets to a fundraising event for Uplift from Oxa Yekemchuk today. It'll be pizza and pasta dinner at the Four Seasons Restaurant. We're going to hold it on Tuesday, May the 14th. Tickets are $26. As well, next week at our birthday Sunday celebration, there's going to be a donation basket, so you can contribute to that as well. Now, the following Sunday, that would be April 28th, we're going to be holding our annual congregational meeting following worship. So plan to stay for lunch in the gymnasium and attend this important meeting. That's going to include a discussion about the future of our church building. You can read more about that conversation as well as program and financial reports in the annual meeting reports booklet, which is in the Narthex. There's also information in the bulletin today about a popcorn fundraiser for the Ignite Choir. Uh, Reverend Amanda, Will, Anne, and Arthur sing in this choir, and if you would like to contribute, you can uh, purchase some popcorn after church this morning, or at least place your order. As we gather today, we remember our mission as a congregation. Christ calls us to be faithful disciples who strive to be joyful in our worship, tender in our life together, and daring in our outreach. We acknowledge that we worship on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional homeland of the Cree, the Ojibwe, the Soto, the Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the home of the Métis Nation. Please stand, if you are able, for the entry of the written word. Good morning. I invite you to join with me in the responsive call to worship. We gather with joy, for Easter brings us new life. The risen Christ is with us wherever we go. Love breaks all bonds and unites us in hope. Christ has defeated death. Let us rejoice and be glad. Come and worship with hearts full of praise. O oh God, receive our grateful hallelujahs. Let us pray. Almighty God, your power makes the lame walk and the dead rise to new life. 
We give you thanks for the love poured into our world through Christ Jesus, who opened our minds to understand what you have made, whose appearance among his followers brings peace, and who creates faith through touch and taste. Show us, Jesus, even now, through the mystery of your threefold presence, one God abiding now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 258, Thine Be the Glory. The one who calls us to repent hears us. In trust that our Creator knows us through and through, let us open our hearts to the healing of God's forgiveness. Let us pray together. God, our Redeemer, in raising Jesus from the dead, you showed us your power to defeat all that brings fear and sorrow to our lives. We confess we are sometimes uncertain if we can trust the promise of resurrection for ourselves. Forgive us when we struggle to trust your goodness for us. Forgive us when we miss the signs of your love in our midst. Speak peace to us when we are doubting or afraid and strengthen us to witness to your love. Amen. Scripture teaches that there is a time for every matter under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn 
and a time to dance. In confessing our sins to God, we have offered God our tears of regret. Now is the time to rejoice in God's mercy. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we have time to make a new start. Thanks be to God. children and youth are now invited to come on up to the front if you wish to join me. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you today. I have to say that uh, having just sung that song with the choir and then seeing a nice crowd of people on the steps, it feels like a second Easter morning because we sang a very, that was a very Easter morning kind of song to sing, very joyful and all about the wonders of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were even a little bit more crowded on these steps because behind us, we didn't just have flowers, we also had a tomb. Do you remember that? We had the empty tomb, and some of you went and checked the tomb to make sure that it was empty, um, and Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. Um, and that was one of the messages we were talking about on Easter Sunday. We were remembering uh, back at the time after Jesus had died, 
and his disciples were figuring out what to do next and wondering what was going to happen. And we, we saw a skit that some of the youth, some of you were in, that showed us um, about that day, um, on early on the Sunday morning, when um, some of the women went to the tomb and they found that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. And uh, they went and called their other friends, the other disciples, and they came and they looked as well and they saw the tomb was empty. And that was the first sign that Jesus might not be dead anymore, that he was raised. But it's not exactly a sure thing, is it? Like, if, you, if someone has died, if Jesus has died and they put him in a tomb, and you find that the stone is rolled away and his body's not there anymore, do you know for sure that he's alive? Does that make sense, that he'd be alive? I mean, it's one possibility, right? But there's other possibilities, and lots of people at that time talked about those other possibilities, like someone could have come and taken his body and moved it somewhere else, maybe buried it somewhere else, who knows? Um, so the tomb being empty was just the first sign. But then, what happened over the next few days, maybe weeks, it's hard to know exactly how long, but over a period of time, Jesus came and appeared before his disciples. So they actually saw him alive. And we saw a little bit of that in the skit two weeks ago, and Ashan was being Jesus, he was acting out the Jesus part, and uh, um, Mary Magdalene, who was played by Mika, was out in the garden, and she saw the tomb was empty, and then, not just the tomb was empty, but then she ran into Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was there, and she realized that it was Jesus, and he was alive and standing right in front of her. Um, and today, all, actually, all through this season of Easter, we're going to get stories about Jesus appearing to different people. First, it was to Mary Magdalene, and then it was to groups of disciples. And there was one story about a couple of disciples walking down the road and Jesus coming and appearing to them and walking with them on the road, if you remember that story. But in today's story, Jesus appears to a whole group of his disciples. And they're, they're gathered together in Jerusalem, and he suddenly, Jesus is there standing with them. And they're going, he's alive, I can't believe it. And they're looking at him and they're going, I still can't believe it. They're looking right at him, but they're thinking, is he a ghost? Like, what's going on here? People who are dead are not suddenly alive again. And so Jesus, because you know, Jesus kind of knows stuff, and he looks at the disciples and he goes, I know they're doubting. They're not believing this. And so he says to them, why don't you reach out and touch me? Why don't you touch me so you can feel? So you're not just trusting what your eyes see, because maybe that could be a ghost. Maybe that could be a, I don't know, an idea in your head, a wishful thinking or something like that. But touch me. And they touched him. And that, maybe that helped a bit. But they were still confused. They were still wondering, could this really be true? Because, of course, it was really strange and really weird. Dead people don't come back to life. It's just not what normally happens. And so after that, Jesus did something even more interesting. Um, he knew they were still doubting, and then he said to them, do you have anything here to eat? And, yeah, <laughs> it's a weird question, eh? Do you have anything here to eat? He was hungry. He needed a snack. And so they said, uh, yeah, we've got some fish. And so uh, they got the fish and they gave the fish to Jesus. And Jesus ate the fish. And that's kind of an interesting thing. I don't know if Jesus did that to help them to see even more that he was really alive. Or maybe he was just hungry. And maybe they just needed to get on with, with doing stuff, living, right? And eating fish, doing all the regular stuff you do. But perhaps it helped them to believe a little bit more. But I was thinking about the stories about Jesus alive, and I was thinking, you know, I've never gotten to see Jesus alive standing in front of me. In a play, yes, in a, pre in a, in a skit of the story. I've seen a Sean pretending to be Jesus, but I haven't actually seen Jesus standing in front of me. And so for us today, when we don't see Jesus standing in front of us, it's a little bit hard for us to believe too. So I wonder, what, think about what is it that helps us to believe, even though we haven't seen Jesus standing right in front of us? I think there's a few things. One of the things is that 
the stories that we have in the Bible and the fact that those who saw Jesus told about it. They were witnesses. They were saying, we saw it. We touched Jesus, and so you can trust us. And then they passed on those stories of their experience from generation to generation. And people from generation to generation believed. They believed that Jesus was alive, and they believed that God was more powerful than death, that good, good news. And we, we trust those who've come before us and the stories, the witness that they've given to us. And then I think more than that, we also trust that sense in our hearts. And I think it's the Holy Spirit that does it, that gives us a gift of faith, a gift of being able to believe, and to believe that God exists and that God loves us. That's something that sometimes just comes as a gift because we don't have proof. We don't have proof about it. But somehow in our hearts, we get that sense that, yeah, I know that God loves me. And I know that God is more powerful than death. And God is more powerful than everything evil and bad in the world. And God then invites us to be on a journey of bringing more good, goodness and more love into the world as well. So we're going to sing a song today. It's about faith. It's about when, um, when hard things happen when evil things are happening around us, and we need that gift of faith. And the words of the song start with, over my head, I hear music in the air. And I think that the, um, the author of this song, the person who wrote this song, they probably had something when they heard music, they heard music and it gave them that sense that God must be real and God was with them. And so there's lots of things that can help us to believe. And sometimes it's like the choir singing, and sometimes it's that sense in our heart, and sometimes it's the love shared between different people. So we give thanks for that gift, and let's stand up and sing.
Good morning. Prayer for illumination, let us pray. God of word and wisdom, the risen Christ opened the minds of his friends to understand the scriptures. Send us your Holy Spirit to open our minds to receive your truth and love, which can fill our hearts and change our lives. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is found in the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And if you'd like, please follow along with your pew Bibles, starting on page 863. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, Let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Our psalm today is Psalm 4, and there is a sung response. shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for God's own. The Lord hears when I call. sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer great sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety.
The Gospel reading today is from Luke 24, 36b to 48. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of, of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. During the season of Easter, the lectionary suggests a lot of scripture readings about the risen Christ appearing to his disciples. It makes sense because there were two important things that shaped the Christian faith of the early church going forward. First, there was the fact that Jesus' tomb was found to be empty, with his body gone. And second, there was the experience and witness of a number of his friends and followers who saw him raised. If you were at worship last Sunday, but perhaps not carefully checking the scripture references, you might have thought that we repeated the same gospel passage today that Taeyang preached about last week. In both cases, it was a story about Jesus appearing to a group of disciples in Jerusalem, not too long after they'd found the tomb to be empty and heard reports from the women that they'd seen Jesus alive. Both of these stories that are probably describing the same event in their own unique ways have Jesus standing among the disciples with a greeting of peace be with you. They also both include some doubt on the part of the disciples, with John's account last week attributing the disbelief and doubt primarily to Thomas, while Luke suggests that all the disciples may have had some questions and wonderings about what they were seeing before them. Last week we heard Thomas make a special request to touch Jesus, to feel his physical body and its wounds. He didn't quite trust what he was seeing with his eyes, and he thought that if he could just touch Jesus, he could know for sure that he was really in today's passage from Luke's account, Jesus senses that his disciples are all quite frightened and experiencing doubts about what they are seeing. So he invites them all to look closely at those wounds. Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When people think about religion, the question of belief is often the focus. Religious traditions are defined by things that the adherents believe, and especially by the things that they believe that may be different from other religions or different from people of no religion. Whereas an atheist is someone who does not believe in the existence of God, and an agnostic is someone who is not committed to believing in either the existence of a god or the non-existence of god, religious people are thought of as those who do believe in god. It seems to define us 
and perhaps that we believe certain things about God, depending on which religion or which branch of that religion we belong to. Of course, Christians are people identified as people who believe in God, and Christians are also the ones who believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead. Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is God's continuing presence in the world and among God's people, and Christians believe in life after death. Of course, there's more than that, but maybe that's just a few of the basics. If someone said, what does a Christian believe? Those are some of the things that would be on the list. We have this long tradition of defining who a Christian is and who a Christian is not based on beliefs about certain things. The ancient creeds of the church, like the Apostles and the Nicene creeds, were written expressly for that purpose of confirming what Christians are supposed to believe, and then determining who is a Christian and who is a heretic, a rather strong word. These are the things that Christians are supposed to believe, we said to one another. And if you don't believe these things in this way, then you are not a Christian. It was a dividing line. And to some extent, we still do that. We don't usually test each other on the way into church, and we're not inclined to shut anyone out if they don't sign on to every detail of either the ancient creeds or our reformed statements of faith or our denominational positions on various theological issues and questions. But we often still use belief as the main measure of who is a Christian and who is not. Now you don't have to think long and hard before recognizing that using expressed belief as the only measure for who is a Christian is going to be problematic. After all, members of the Ku Klux Klan identified as Christians and probably believed the basic stuff in the creeds, and so did members of the Nazi party under Hitler. And most of us probably bristled when we saw in the news a few weeks ago about Donald Trump selling Bibles across the United States. He also would identify as a Christian and even claims to have attended a Presbyterian Sunday school. Even if he likely couldn't answer even simple theological questions, I expect that he would say that he believes in God. He believes in the resurrection and he believes in life after death. So our faith and our identity as Christian people has got to be about more than just belief, about more than just holding certain ideas about God and Jesus in our heads. Last Sunday evening, I went to Mass with Nick at Campion College, and the preacher was Father Scott Lewis, a Jesuit who is also a biblical scholar and an expert on the Gospel of John. In fact, about 25 years ago, I took a course on the Gospel of John from Scott Lewis when he was teaching at the Toronto School of Theology. In talking about Thomas and his hesitancy to believe, Scott explained that the author of John's Gospel means something more when he talks about believing. Belief for John is not just a confidence and conviction that something is true. It's not just an idea in your head. But belief carries this deeper sense of assurance that transforms a person's life. Belief is deeply connected to our response to what we believe. So belief in God and in Jesus Christ risen includes trusting God and loving God, and loving our neighbors, and following Jesus with our lives, and giving ourselves for others, and taking risks for the sake of God's mission in the world. Now, our Gospel reading this morning was not from John, that was last week, but from Luke, which was written quite a bit earlier in the first century and may not have had that all-encompassing idea of belief yet. But what I noticed about today's text was that the disciples' doubts and their questions and their wonderings 
about the risen Jesus standing right in front of them were not considered to be a big problem. The first thing that happened when Jesus appeared was that they were startled and terrified and thought they might be seeing a ghost. Jesus knew what they were thinking and feeling and helped them out by giving them a bit more information and evidence about what was going on. They weren't sure that they could trust their eyes, so he invited them to touch him and use another sense to confirm what their eyes were telling them. That was very thoughtful of him. But do you remember Thomas's response last week when he got to touch Jesus' hands and side? After he touched, after he got that extra bit of confirmation, he exclaimed, My Lord and my God! Now, it wasn't a whole Christian creed, as those wouldn't be written for a few hundred more years, but it was one of the earliest and most basic of Christian creeds, an expression of his belief in Christ as Lord and God. The disciples in today's text don't say anything of the sort after touching the risen Jesus. In fact, the narrator writes, Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. They were happy, they were joyful, they were amazed by what they were seeing and touching, but they were simultaneously disbelieving and wondering. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot more like the way that I believe. I mean, I believe that Christ was raised and that the Holy Spirit is present and active in the church and the world. I see lots of evidence of that in acts of love and generosity and forgiveness and compassion and sacrifice happening all the time. And in fact, when I hear the choir sing, or when um, we sing over my head, I hear music in the air, all those things convince me more and more of that faith that I have in God. But I can't help but be discouraged by all the bad stuff too, by the violence, by the discrimination, by the greed and selfishness that seems so powerful in our world. And when professing Christians and churches participate and even lead the way in such hatred and evil, it's all the more discouraging and likely to cause doubts to arise in my heart. The next thing that happens in the story is not Jesus noticing and pointing out that the disciples still seem to be experiencing doubts. I expect he knew it, but he didn't keep going on about it. Instead, he asked for a snack. Have you anything here to eat? Jesus asked. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Some interpreters will suggest that Jesus wasn't actually hungry and needing something to eat. They'll say that he asked for their food the food in order to give them one more piece of evidence that he was truly and physically alive again. And I suppose they're right that it might have helped a bit because we all know that ghosts don't eat fish. I don't know. I don't know a lot about ghosts. But, but I wonder if Jesus was not really so worried about how perfectly and unstintingly his followers believed in his resurrection and he was more focused on turning their attention towards the mission that he had for them to continue in his name. I like the way that the Salt Lectionary Commentary described that mission. They called it feeding the hungry person right in front of them, for starters. After that, Jesus did spend some time teaching the disciples reminding them of what they probably already knew from the scriptures and all that he had taught them over the last few years. He didn't give them a creed and tell them that they needed to adhere to it carefully, but he sent them out to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins to the world, starting right where they were. In other words, 
The people of the world are invited to turn towards love and mend their relationships. We're invited to follow the humble, generous, gracious way of Jesus with one another and to share what we have seen and come to believe through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we are loved, that we are made for love, and that God, will, who is love, will empower us to love. Do you remember Easter Sunday in church when I drew you all into that repeating refrain? We'll see if you remember it a couple of weeks later. Christ is risen. Not too bad. You still remembered it. <laughs> well, we did it a lot of times on Sunday morning, and I realized towards the end of it, I put that little refrain a lot of times in that service, and you all obediently joined with me in the refrain. But if when we joined in that refrain that it was somehow just a little bit half-hearted, somewhat impeded by lingering doubts or questions about this strange and startling and astounding and totally unlikely thing that we profess in our creeds, that Jesus has been raised from the dead? I get it. I think we all get it, that there are doubts there, right side by side with the gift of faith. I think the disciples, those first disciples, would have understood. And I think Jesus did as well. Like Jesus' friends on that day, Easter fills us with joy. While we are simultaneously disbelieving and still wondering. I think Jesus understands that and invites us to feed the hungry person standing right in front of us and to study the scriptures and to ask questions and grapple with answers and study some more. And Jesus invites us to go and share and to be witnesses to what we have seen, probably most effectively by loving one another as he taught us to do. Let us pray. God, our maker, source of Easter power and hope, you have walked with your faithful people through many generations, people facing challenge and uncertainty, people seeking your purpose and promise, people with lingering doubts and the gift of faith that propels them forward to follow in the way of Jesus. We still face challenges and uncertainty, even with Easter in our hearts. Walk with us, and with those for whom we pray for this day, so that your resurrecting power may lead us in lives of faithfulness. We pray for children and young people who must think about the future in uncertain times, facing threats old and new. Give them hope rooted in the knowledge that their lives matter to you. Show them how to make a difference in the world, whatever threats they face as they grow. We pray for people for whom age or experience, illness or disability create barriers to full participation in your world. Surround each one in pain or despair with your comfort and renew in each one a sense of dignity and purpose. Show them how much they matter to you and to us. We pray for all those facing grief and any kind of loss. We especially remember the Pugsley and Ireton families today. Give them strength and comfort. We pray for communities challenged by forces beyond their control, natural disaster and environmental threats, conflict and violence, economic hardship. We pray for the people affected by the earthquake in Taiwan and all those who live in the midst of tragedy and turmoil. Give courage to those facing these challenges and wisdom to those who lead so that well-being may be restored 
and hope for the future prevail. As signs of spring emerge, we pray for your creation, for creatures losing habitat and unique species at risk, for oceans clogged with plastic and the earth aching for moisture as the climate warms. Jesus, you are the firstborn of all creation. Help us to honor you by caring for the earth and its fragile balances in the ways we live and the priorities we set. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways that you gift us with faith as tiny as a mustard seed. And we pray in hope and trust that in us and beyond us it will grow. We give you thanks that you are with us in our doubts and our questions, and you simply call us to follow. Remembering Jesus and his teaching, we pray in the words that he prayed for us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is number 256, Now the Green Blade Rises. And then appear to the disciples bringing peace. So let us now bring wholeness and healings to others through our tithes and offerings.
Lord God, we offer to you only a portion of what you have given to us. All that we have is from your creative hand. All that we can give away, we do through Jesus' love. All our renewal comes from the Holy Spirit's wisdom. Deal graciously with these gifts so that others may have joy. In Jesus' name, amen. And our final hymn this morning is number 461, Be Thou My Vision. God assures us what we will be has not yet been revealed. Live therefore with hope, share your joy, withhold your anger, shed your disappointments, turn to all people with gentleness. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look upon you with grace and mercy and give you peace. Amen. Amen.